Welcome. In this video, we'll be giving an in-depth look at the animation of the Order 1886. First, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Adam Byrne, and I'm the lead gameplay animator at Ready at Dawn. And I'm Daniel. I'm the lead cinematic animator. For those not familiar with The Order 1886, it's a PlayStation 4 exclusive which takes place in an alternate history Victorian London. You play as Galahad, a member of The Order, and a knight from Arthurian legend. In this video, we'll talk about how he made gameplay and cinematic animation flow seamlessly together. But before we talk about The Order, let's talk about Rad's past work. Ready at Dawn's previous games are Daxter, God of War Chains of Olympus, and God of War Ghost of Sparta. All of these games were developed for the PSP, they were all stylized action platformer games, and they were all created using hand keyframed animation. The Order represents a lot of firsts for Ready at Dawn. It's our first original IP and first game of this genre. We developed a new engine specifically for The Order, and it was our first time developing for home console. Lastly, this was our first game to use motion capture. As you might imagine, this was an insanely ambitious project but it also provided us with the freedom to explore what was possible. We started development with a simple concept. We wanted to make a story-driven third-person shooter. The next step was choosing games and film to draw inspiration from. We were influenced by games like Uncharted, The Last of Us, and Gears of War, and inspired by the tone and storytelling of films like Blade Runner, Casino Royale, and the recent Sherlock Holmes films. The combination of these influences led us to our visual style, which we call filmic realism. So what does filmic mean? It means translating the style and language of film into a playable game. It also means weaving the story throughout all aspects of the game, not just the cinematics, but also gameplay. And we wanted to blend those two as seamlessly as possible. So as a proof of concept, we developed a prototype for the order. This gave us a chance to test our visual and technical ideas before jumping into the real thing. You might notice that the player's motion is more primitive than in the final product. Our initial approach was heroic proportions and hand-keyed, stylized movement. But after sprinkling motion capture into the game, we pushed in a more realistic direction. So what did we learn from the prototype? Well, to match the realistic rendering of the environment, we needed to create characters that moved more realistically. Like all of our previous games, prototype characters had stylized proportions, but this just wouldn't work if we wanted them to look real. Keyframe animation also wouldn't cut it anymore. It took too long and was never quite realistic enough. And even though we didn't have much experience with motion capture, we knew that we needed to build our entire pipeline around it. So before we could even begin to create realistic animation, we knew we needed to rethink our rigs. The first thing we had to address was that our characters had stylized proportions. The next thing was that we had two very different pipelines for editing mocap and keyframe animation. And this led us to create a combination mocap offset rig. So let's talk about character proportions. On the left, we have our prototype hero. In the middle, we have our updated proportions. And on the right, we have our final character model. On the prototype character, you can see that the arms and legs were longer and the torso was shorter. These proportions worked in our previous games, but we realized that this game needed to be more realistic. So we went back and based our proportions on body scans. With the proportions finalized, we then modeled our clothes on top of the base mesh. This gave us a sense that he was wearing clothes instead of just being made of clothes. So let's go back and talk about our mocap pipeline. During prototype, we had two separate pipelines for mocap and keyframe animation. One pipeline was a simple FK rig that was set up to work exclusively with mocap. The other was a more traditional rig for keyframe animation. Because the rigs were incompatible, transferring animations between the two was a huge pain. After working with Motion Builder and talking to our friends at Naughty Dog, we were inspired to combine our FK and control rigs to create a unified mocap offset rig. So let's talk more about this rig because we built our entire animation pipeline around it. For keyframe animation, we can still use the rig as we always had. It's very animator friendly with lots of parent space options as well as IK FK switching on the limbs. But once we imported mocap into it, we could use the keyframe portion of the rig as an offset to the mocap data, which made it really flexible. Here's an example of how we used offsets. On the left is our mocap skeleton, which has a very hunched over posture. And on the right, you can see the result of the animator offsets. The posture has been corrected. Flatten and trace was another important feature. Essentially, it let us commit our offsets, baking them down onto the mocap skeleton, or conversely, it let us bake up our mocap to the control rig. Now we'll talk about how realism applies to cinematics. So realism can mean a lot of things. 
what we were really striving for was realism of film. So we've had film in our culture for a really long time, and we've accepted many of its quirks as real, even when they aren't. So part of the goal with the cinematics was to make them feel like a live-action film instead of a computer-generated one. This starts with the motion capture and actor performances. The next is to try to ground the characters to the world, which is really hard to do in CG. The last was to try to make our camera feel real and have a presence in the world. So let's talk about how we captured our performances. So here we have a breakdown of the steps we took in crafting our cinematics. Whenever possible, we would capture audio, face, and body together. We would then take the raw data into Motion Builder and shoot cameras to start the editing process. We took the face video and projected it onto the head. This allowed us to make confident editing choices as we moved on to cleaning up the mocap. Once the edit was locked, we would then clean up the body and hand offsets in Motion Builder before moving on to Maya to finish the fingers and hand polish. We solved our faces in a separate pipeline, so we couldn't see what they looked like when cleaning up the body motion. This meant we had to rely on the initial edit as our guide. We utilized Sony's Visual Arts Service Group for their expertise in the capture process and relied on them as an outsourcing team. The final step was to get the cinematic running in engine. Here you can see the final image with the heads and bodies combined. There's a lot of technical animation polish that was needed to finish off all the cinematics, as well as fixing any last minute changes that inevitably come up in production. The next goal was to have the characters feel grounded. When shooting live action, characters naturally feel grounded, and with motion capture, it takes a very conscious effort to achieve the same results. We wanted to avoid the pitfalls of characters avoiding contact with objects in their surroundings, which is common with mocap and animation in general. We would constantly build sets that push the limit of the mocap stage. While this added complexity, it helped us avoid people just standing around in circles. This also allowed us to block out actions around the set and allowed the actors to react to them. Because the actors are spaced out, it allowed us to shoot in a way that used the environment to give more depth to the scenes. So now let's talk about our camera philosophy. A lot of time was spent on the graphical rendering side to make lenses feel and behave accurately, but we also wanted to make sure that the motion of the camera felt accurate. So here are some examples of camera moves from our previous games. Note that the camera makes impossible movements in order to frame the action. It'll rotate, zoom, and move in ways that wouldn't be possible with a real camera. It tracks actions perfectly and moves through the world with very little to no weight or limitations. While this type of camera movement can create really dramatic framing, it breaks the illusion of realism. So our first rule was to have no impossible camera moves. If you couldn't make the shot with a real camera, we would avoid it. And just like our characters, we wanted imperfections in our camera motion, which meant applying mocap to all of our cameras, even the in-game ones. We would also only use a limited set of fixed lenses. Films don't have an infinite selection of focal length choices, so we decided that we didn't either. This helped define a style for shot selection for the game as a whole, but we could also apply realistic parameters to all those lenses. So here's the first scene we put into production after Prototype. And this scene really set the tone for every cinematic that we did afterwards. You can see how grounded the characters feel because of the hand contacts, and how they're moving through the space avoiding obstacles. If you pay close attention to the camera, you can see the framing doesn't always follow the action quite perfectly. There's some imperfection to it. And how the handheld field gives the camera both some additional weight and adds stylistic grittiness to the scenes and to the world. You can also start to see how the limited lens choices were used, shots begin to feel consistent, and the fact that we modeled our lenses to accurately have the right distortion, depth of field, chromatic aberration, gives them a sense of realism as well. All these factors come together to make the scene feel like it was shot with a real camera in a real location. Now let's talk about gameplay animation. From prototype, we defined our goals. The first was to achieve the most realistic animation possible. We didn't want to make any excuses for the motion being unrealistic just because this was a game. And the other goal was to never let aesthetics trump control. In other words, we didn't want to put visuals before gameplay or vice versa, but we knew that striking a perfect balance would require rethinking a lot of traditional approaches to game animation systems. Next, we identified some common characteristics of game animation that break immersion. First, we have abrupt transitions. Blending between two animations is often very noticeable and breaks the illusion of reality. And because of previous limitations, idle and move cycle animations can often be very repetitive. And since the Order 1886 was based on strafing, which means you can face one direction while moving in any direction, we had to think about strafe blending. This can be accomplished in a number of ways, but often doesn't feel natural. 
Games usually adjust animation playback speed to add more sensitivity to the control, but this can often lead to slow-mo or fast-forward looking animation. And last we have animation layer and split body, which are useful features, but sometimes they lead to the characters feeling like parts of their bodies are disconnected. Let's start with abrupt transitions. One of the biggest issues with games is harsh blending. We typically see one animation abruptly change to another in a tenth of a second, which breaks immersion. So here's our philosophy on animation transitions. First, if you don't need multiple animations, avoid the transition entirely. There are still places where you need quick blending. Players expect immediate feedback on input, but all other blending should be invisible to the player. A good example of an unnecessary transition can be found in stand idols. They're typically made up of multiple short animations that randomly cycle. The seams are noticeable, and the movement becomes very recognizable after thousands of views. The solution was something we learned from our friends at Naughty Dog, to simply have one long idol. This removed the repetitive quality and kept the motions from becoming recognizable. It also removed almost all the seams and gave us the opportunity to have more natural performances. But now that we had long idols, a new challenge presented itself. Typically, anytime a player moves, it restarts the idol from the beginning. The result is that we only see the first few seconds of the idol over and over, no matter how long it is. To fix this, we implemented a resume feature. Whenever an idle is interrupted, it remembers where it left off. Whenever the character begins idling again, it picks up from there. Now let's talk about quick blending. Simple, fast blending still has an important place in games. On inputs like hitting a button, deflecting or releasing the stick, the user expects immediate feedback. So a quick blend in this circumstance feels appropriate. All other blends should be smooth and seamless. Here's where things start getting interesting. Ideally, transitions that aren't triggered by the player should be so transparent that the player doesn't even know it happened. This goal led us to develop two important blending features. Transitioning into an idle uses settle blending, and transitioning into movement uses phase blending. We'll talk about both of these in depth. Since our idles can resume playing from any point, we couldn't just end on a pose that matched the idle because there was no standard idle pose anymore. To fix this, we created settle blends. Here's an example involving run-stop animations. After a short action portion where the feet plant, the settle is a long cross-blend between the run-stop and the idle animation. This makes it very difficult to tell where one animation ends and the other begins. We tried anything from a half a second to three seconds, but we found that the sweet spot for settle blends is about one second long. Next, we tackle blending into movement. In reality, beginning to run requires complex and recognizable body mechanics. Mocap gave us believable motion, but blending into movement was the tricky part. In previous games, we matched the end frame of the move start animation with the first frame of the move cycle. This isn't very scalable when you have hundreds of move start animations. And even if all the poses match, the movement of all the body parts won't without a huge amount of cleanup. Lastly, move starts are usually too short. Games expedite them to get the characters into move cycles as fast as possible. This detracts from the believability because the weight shift required to start moving tends to last more than a few steps. The solution to all of these issues is phase blending. So what are phases? They're designated sections of move cycles which are used to synchronize animations, regardless of move speed, animation timing, direction of movement, or number of cycles. Animators tag each animation, identifying which phases fall on which frames. The engine then reads these tags and blends animations together using a phase clock, which progressively averages the phases of all the animations playing. Here's an example of how phase blending allows us to transition seamlessly between a move start and a move cycle. Halfway through a move start animation, phases are detected and matched with a similar phase in the cycle. There are four phases in this run start, so the system finds the first four phases in the run cycle to match. Then the playback speed of both animations is progressively adjusted so the phases line up. And here's the result. Because the blend is happening over many frames and is masked by the movement of both animations, it's almost impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. Phases also allowed us to blend between a run start and a walk cycle, or a walk start and a run cycle. So now that we have solutions to blending and transitions, let's go back to our common animation issues and talk about repetitive cycles.
We've already solved the repetition problem when it comes to idle animations by extending the animation length. So let's talk about how repetition relates to move cycles. Traditionally, navigation animations are a single cycle, two steps. This requires the animation to be extremely uniform with minimal nuance and also removes the ability to have any acting in the performance. To solve this, we created multi-cycle movement animations and used phase blending to keep them in sync regardless of the number of cycles of each animation. On the left, we have a multi-cycle animation. On the right, we have the same animation reduced to a single cycle. At first, the two look very similar, but after watching the animation on the right loop over and over, you start to notice a robotic, repetitive quality to it. No matter how hard you try, each step you take will land in a slightly different place at a slightly different timing, and the body will naturally make subtle weight shifts to keep you moving in a straight line. We found that three to five cycles was the sweet spot, giving us a variety of movement necessary to keep the animation from feeling repetitive. Now let's talk about strafe blending. Since the order's movement system is based on strafing, we created animations for several movement directions, which are synced up using phase blending. This presented another challenge. How do we switch from forward type movement to backward type movement? In our original system, we used four directional animations for strafing, forward, back, left, and right. Since left and right were technically forward type movement, blending between them and backwards resulted in sliding and the legs passing through each other. To solve this, we added sidestep type movements, which blend correctly between forward and backward type movement. Because humans favor forward type movement, we limited backwards to straight back. Because of this, we chose 135 degrees to the left and the right as our sidestep angles for normal movement. While aiming weapons, the body is naturally turned to the right and less biased towards forward type movement, so we chose 45 degrees to the left and 135 degrees to the right as our sidestep angles for aiming. Next, let's talk about issues with animation playback speed. In the past, we were limited to discrete movement types like walk and run, which were sped up or slowed down to match the player's stick deflection. This leads to unnatural movement that looks either slow-mo or fast-forward. To fix this, we simply added more speed increments. We use phase blending to synchronize all of these movements and play the appropriate ones based on stick deflection. We have four standard move speeds, slow walk, walk, jog, and run. The result is sensitive player controls with believable character movement. Moving on to animation layer and split body issues. Animation layers aren't a new concept. They have a lot of great uses in games, but also some pitfalls. There are two ways of using animation layers on a joint, additive or replace. Additive layers add animation data together, which is useful when you want to retain motion but change a pose. Replace layers ignore all the animation data beneath them, this is useful when you want to overwrite the motion of other layers completely. In the order, we use animation layers for things like aim offsets and weapon hand grips, among other things. Here's an example of how you use upper body additive animation layers to aim in any direction while retaining the full body motion of the aim idle. We use replace layers for things like arms holding rifles during base navigation, finger grips to match each individual weapon, and hip fire to replace the upper body during base nav. Hip fire and aim animation layers presented us with the biggest challenges. Split body is a feature where you play a different animation on the top and bottom halves of the body. This is extremely useful, but often results in the upper and lower halves of the body feeling disconnected. Because of this, we opted for full body aim strafe animations to keep the body feeling cohesive. For hipfire, we couldn't use full body animations without duplicating our entire movement library, so that wasn't an option. We also couldn't simply replace the upper body with a static pose, because as you can see on the left, that looks really bad. Instead, we replaced the upper body animation and used phases to sync the upper and lower body layers together. This gave us a natural look in every movement direction with only one upper body additive animation. That covers the five main animation issues, but let's add a bonus feature. Pivots are what we call animations that quickly transfer from one movement direction to another. When a real person changes direction, they have to drop their weight down and plant their feet in a way that diverts all of their momentum in a new direction. Creating the animations wasn't too difficult, aside from tuning them aggressively to make them feel more responsive. But finding the right numbers to trigger pivots proved to be much more challenging, and there's still some room for improvement. We talked a bunch about how we made cinematics feel real, and the things we did to make gameplay motion feel real.
But now let's talk about how we tried to blend the two to make the entire game a filmic experience. First, we tried to identify some of the obvious visual clues that you can tell gameplay from cinematics. We'll talk about transitioning between cinematics and gameplay. Then we'll talk about gameplay into cinematics. And finally, how we try to keep a consistent style between the two. So what are some of these visual clues? Pre-rendered scenes, even rendered in the game engine, become apparent due to compression artifacts. So one of the big selling points for us was that everything had to be real time. When games use different character models for cinematics and gameplay, there's a noticeable change in fidelity, from the resolution of the mesh to the use of different shaders applied to the character. We decided early on to use the exact same asset in cinematics and in gameplay to avoid any of these discrepancies. This had the added benefit of simplifying our pipeline because it meant we didn't have to manage two different assets. So another indicator is the camera. Obvious blends of the camera swinging into position or bad camera transitions also become recognizable indicators that the game has switched modes. And like cameras, obvious blends on the character also give away the illusion. And the last major difference is in the way that cinematics and gameplay are shot, and this will include lens choices, framing, and camera movement. So how do we approach transitioning from cinematic to gameplay? The first step was that we would just match the pose. And when we started, we didn't have all the gameplay systems we do now. So starting by matching the pose was really the best we could do but just matching the pose by itself wasn't enough. During cinematics, we turn the collision off for characters to avoid any problems with the physics as the character moves and interacts with the environment. And this works great until you have to turn the collision back on for gameplay. The problem is, if the character was animated to be even slightly above the ground, once the cinematic ended, they would immediately start falling and then quickly land, creating a noticeable pop. And the opposite is true. If they're animated below the ground, they either get stuck on the floor or the game would pop them upwards to move them to a valid position. What we would often do is animate the character to where we thought the character should end up, run the game, see where the game's collision code would actually put the character at the end of the cinematic. We would then take those valid positions and reanimate the character in Maya using our additive rig to that new location. Eventually, we got a code solution to help ease this, but the more accurate we could make it initially, the better the scenes ended up. And like the character, the camera also tended to blend back to a valid position if the camera was too close or too far once the cinematic ended. So once we animated the character to the right location without any pops, we would then compose and capture a new valid camera position. And using those values from the game, we would work backwards to make sure that the cinematic ended in that camera position. We had to pull these values from the game because, like the player, the camera uses its own collision and prediction. So this was our first example of our seamless transition from cinematic to gameplay. We had a number of playtesters put the controller down to watch the cinematic, and then end up sitting for a minute, not realizing that the game had actually started. So we consider this a great success. You can see on the top, we had the player not pressing on the stick, and on the bottom, the stick being held forward. And near the end of the project, we started not only matching the pose, but also using subtle blends. This meant we could cross blend into the game state. Using subtle blends meant we could also break out sooner. So if the user was pressing forward on the stick, the character would start moving before the cinematic animation had finished, preserving some of the momentum instead of just settling. But because this feature came on late, unfortunately, we didn't really have enough time to tune all of our cinematics, but when it was used, it ended up being very successful. You can see on the top camera, Galahad continuing to settle with no input from the player, and on the bottom, the player breaking out of the cinematic early. So the final piece was how NPCs move from cinematic to gameplay, and there was a number of ways we approached this. Like the player, we started with just matching end poses of the NPCs to their idle states. This, however, had the problem of characters coming to life as their AI would kick in once the cinematic animation was over. We had two solutions for this. One was to have the AI already active in the last shot, cutting their animation short. And this solved the problem of having them wake up, but it meant we couldn't really direct performance. The other was we started using phase blending. This allowed us to get a bit of character performance as they started pathing to their next location, and it resulted in a seamless transition that offered the best movement into the space. So here's some examples of phase blending in action. Ultimately, we used a mix of all three solutions in the game, depending on the situation. Unlike going from cinematics, which is a known state, to gameplay, Going from gameplay to cinematics have a lot of unknowns. So there are three different ways that we would trigger cinematics. Interacts, where the player would hit a button to start the cinematic. Trigger volumes, 
where the player would walk into a space in the game and time triggers where a condition would happen that started the cinematic. So let's go over Interax. Interact syncing occurs when a screen prompt is activated by the player. On activation, the character is blended and then synced to an object. Blending is the procedural animating of a character from one pose to another pose, where syncing is the process of translating and rotating the entire character to a specific location relative to the world. There are two major benefits of interact syncing. The first is that the player has control over when the cinematic is triggered, and the second is that because the cinematic is triggered at a specific location, we know exactly where the player is. Because the player is interacting with an object, we can also use this motion to motivate the first cut. Typically, we animate the character as close to the object as possible. If the player is too far from the starting location to just use syncing, we use AI to path them closer. This let our designers adjust the activation radius without animators having to go back and adjust the animation or the sync and blend times. So here you can see the character walk over to a position before he starts to open the door. We also wanted the weapons that the characters had in gameplay to carry over into cinematics. But trying to capture every different variation would have been extremely difficult. So instead, we would mocap our actors without weapons. We would then use the in-game holster animations to put their weapons away before beginning cinematics. And because the player is interacting with an object, it felt natural for the character to first holster the weapon to help free up their hands. Because we never know exactly where the camera is, we have to blend it. We found it was always better to blend forward into a scene or in the direction of the first cut than to blend backwards. So we would animate the camera closer than was valid for gameplay to make sure this happened. Trigger volumes are when the player would walk into a space. And unlike interacts, which are at specific points, trigger volumes are more like crossing a threshold. So not only is there a larger variation in location, but the player is also always moving into the trigger, which means there's a variation in how fast the player is going. To mitigate some of these unknowns, we would try to funnel the player by having the trigger happen either at doorways or when entering narrow spaces. And setting up these volumes at obvious thresholds had the added benefit of letting the player dictate when they were ready to progress forward. One of the easiest ways to start these cinematics was with a reverse shot once the player touched the volume. Cutting immediately and having the player move into the space did seem to work, uh, but it's also very abrupt. When we needed a better transition, we would sync and blend the character into position. We could then cut once the action motivated it. The problem with this is that the character is moving, so we really needed to try to match the speed the character is going. It tended to work best when we would favor the player fully pressing on the stick and animate to that speed. The other thing we tried to do was to use the AI to start an action to help motivate the first cut. Here you can see the woman on the screen left start to wave to Galahad once he crosses the threshold. This helps motivate the cut. So the best advice I can give about time triggers is to avoid them whenever possible. Even when they work, you don't know which way the character is facing, which means a hard cut will come out of nowhere and can be extremely disorienting to the player. So here's an example we use to that effect, but you can also see that it breaks the continuity of the scene. The best option is to cut to something else first so you can then cheat where and what the player was doing. Here we have a couple examples of how we try to make both the gameplay and cinematics feel similar through editing and shot selection. Uh, some of the things we did is we would use the same focal length for cinematics and gameplay. An example is cover and say, mid shot in the cinematic. More specific examples are using similar framing of shots. An example is the camera that follows Galahad in gameplay. The other is a similar treatment of how melee is done in both cinematics and in gameplay. So let's go over the follow cam in cinematics. When tracking with characters, we always try to be over the right shoulder and at a similar distance. Here we can see, even though we are transitioning to a cinematic, we try to echo the game camera as we follow Galahad through the door. Here's another example of how we use that same type of camera to move the player into cover to help make the transition seamless. We even use that shot in the middle of a cinematic whenever we are following the player running. In this cinematic, we use it multiple times, trying to keep both a similar distance and feel to the gameplay. And let's end with a montage of our melee takedowns.
These were done by our gameplay team and really show how we integrated a lot of the cinematic principles into our gameplay. And that wraps things up. We'd like to thank our incredible artists, programmers, and designers at Ready at Dawn, Sony Visual Arts Service Group, Sony Santa Monica, Naughty Dog, and Autodesk for making this game and this video possible. Thanks for watching.